Hey guys, Tennessee Yankee, welcome to the channel. Hey, for some of you guys, this might be the first time you're tuning in. Um, I'm doing a review today on my Kubota LX2610. I wanted to wait to do a review on this tractor until I had a lot of seat time. I just turned over 100 hours last month. I actually have 110 hours on it right now. And I wanted to kind of go around the tractor, give you guys my thoughts, things I like, things I don't like. And hopefully this will be helpful to you guys, whether you're looking for a, you know, a brand new LX2610 or possibly a used one uh, in the future. So hopefully this is helpful to you. Let's get after it. All right, guys, I don't know how long this video is going to be. I'm going to try to be very extensive, like I have been on some of my other review videos. Obviously, when you're in the market looking for a new tractor, uh, I personally consume a lot of YouTube content. So there may be some repetitive content here, maybe stuff you've already seen from maybe somebody at Messix or whatever, but it's always good to hear other people's firsthand opinions of of what they like, what they dislike, what works for them, what doesn't. So guys, this is a 2022 LX2610. Got this last July. Um, actually, the tractor was available last year since like May is when I ordered it. And it didn't, I ended up waiting till July for the loader to come in. So um, that, that, was a, that was a long waiting period, but uh, it was worth the wait. I use this mainly around my property in East Tennessee here. I have six acres of woods and I've been uh, using it quite a bit to work on my landscape a little bit, chip trees, uh, work on some paths through my woods, just an all around fun utilitarian tractor. One of the things that may be unique about this versus some of the other models is the choice of tires that you may find yourself looking at. I went with the R14 T tires. Uh, I did get these filled with the the uh, rim guard, which is just basically a, a beet juice, but it uh, adds. I think it adds about 200 pounds to each tire. I would say that's a must when you're getting a tractor. Make sure you get the ballast in the tires. Um, it, it's just worked really well to help keep it planted. Uh, but these tires have just been phenomenal. They have great grip. If I'm careful in the yard and I'm I'm not in four-wheel drive, I can go around the yard without tearing it up. As soon as I go into four-wheel drive, the yard wants to get tore up. So I'm just always careful when I'm when I'm up in the yard that I try to put it back into two-wheel drive. But I can tell you uh, these tires are are pretty awesome, and they do pretty good on the pavement too. I hear they're they're pretty good at wearing. I I do a little bit of pavement around here, just going in and out of my yard and. I've gone up and down the road in my neighborhood a few times, but uh, they seem to do well. And then the front is just, you know, the standard R14 tire for the for the front. Um, the other thing I did that was kind of custom to this tractor, which I highly recommend, is I did get the wheel spacers put in there. Um, I'll take a measurement of those for you. I think they're one and a half inch wheel spacers. So it's not a lot, but it does add stability. And a lot of the stuff I do on around here is on a hill. I'm always careful to go, you know, straight up and down. Um, but I wanted those wheel spacers for the extra stability. I would like to have a set in the front. I don't really know if that's a thing. I haven't researched it. Might be a little hard on the axle. Um, but it'd kind of be nice to, to widen that front a little bit too. But I've never really had any tippy issues with it, uh, but I'm always really careful with it as well. So those are kind of the, the unique things that could be different on this tractor. So when I was picking out my model, I had some choices. Obviously the, the cab is a choice. I decided to just go with the ROPS. I didn't need the extra expense of the cab. I don't have a lot of inclement weather to deal with. So save some money right there. And then there was also the HSD model, which this is, or there's the SU model. So the HSD model adds a mid-mount PTO, um, and then it also adds the tilt steering, the more comfortable seat, and then I think there's like a cruise, well, I know there is a like a cruise control function uh, for mowing. So really, I'm not going to use the mid-mount mower, and I'm not going to use the cruise control feature, but I just thought 
for the resale value, it was worth getting this model because really what I, I wanted to have was that tilt steering wheel and the more comfortable seat. Um, so I figured by adding those, you know, it was only six or $800 more when I priced this out between the two models. So I just went with this one uh, to get those, those features. I figured later if I decided to change the seat or add it, it was gonna cost me an arm and a leg. So I just did this model up front, which I've been happy with. So again, for you guys doing the research, I want to give you a thorough walkthrough of kind of the cockpit of the tractor to let you know uh, what we have here. So let me climb up on here. Okay, so immediately to your left, um, you have your low, medium, neutral, high. That's pretty standard. Um, and then what we have here is the uh, PTO selector switch. So right now it's at the rear position. Here you can see you can run both the mid mount and the rear, and then here in the front position, you're only running the mid mount. So I just always leave it at the back because that's the only PTO I'm ever using. And then this lever here is to engage and disengage the PTO. So on the right side of the seat over here, you have your 12 volt, which is, comes in handy, and then a little, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, I guess phone holder. I've put two kinds of phones in there and they seem to stay pretty good. They haven't fallen out and, and got smashed or anything. So then here you have your three point selector here. They do have this little goofy knob that's kind of awkward that you could set your minimum height. But what I've found with this three point and maybe it's a problem that I have with settings. Um, what's weird is like sometimes I'm between seven and four and I could hardly tell a difference between the two. I just had this, I had my rake like barely probably two inches off the ground and my selector was actually like at five where I would expect that to be like at a one or two. So I'm not sure there. It's probably all has to do with the amount of uh, play and tension you have in your three point linkage back there as far as your top link, how much you have it, you know, dialed in, screwed in tight versus long. Um, I'm sure that has to account for a lot of the variability there, but uh, they do have a float model down at the bottom. But what I find is it's kind of weird. It seems like this gauge is a little bit in the way of the float model, but I'm sure it's not. It just appears that way. So right here you have your four-wheel drive. So you can see here. When it's here, they have that center diff box basically closed closed up. And then if you see on this one, it's broken. So that one shows you're in two wheel drive there. So let's talk about the loader joystick. You know, I'm sitting here, my uh, I'm back in the seat. It's very comfortable. Um, this has been pretty awesome to use. There's your little diagram of, of how everything works. Uh, you know, you just learn through through using it, and pretty soon after a week or two, it's like you just you just know all the all the ways you're supposed to be moving. It's pretty amazing. And then this is the third function kit that's added. So this is going to control um, a grapple when I eventually have one. I had that installed from uh, the dealership before I before I brought it home. So that'll be ready to go when I get the grapple. Okay, coming over here, which you can see is you have your treadle pedal, so reverse and then forward. This thing is kind of hard on your leg after you're using the tractor for several hours, going here back and forth. I've noticed before, like my leg will cramp up at night sometimes, just depending on how much you're using it. I really liked it on my John Deere, on my, uh, my garden tractor, how they have the front and the reverse pedal. I think that would definitely be an improvement. I think this treadle's probably a a uh, Kubota thing, I don't know, but I really appreciate the front and rear levers on my John Deere. Um, over here on this side is the tilt wheel. So it seems like a convenient spot. It's easy to take the wheel up and down. So this is the furthest down position. And then here's the furthest up position. Um, it's very convenient. I always usually find myself driving with it all the way down. But it's nice to get it out of your way when you are getting on and off the tractor. I'm not sure the position of a fixed steering wheel. I would imagine it's about halfway here. 
I'm sure you'd get used to that too, but it is nice having the tilt. Uh, what is not so nice is a lot of times I found myself bumping this. You know, I'm driving, I'm moving my foot around, and all of a sudden I'm bumping the steering wheel. So while it's easy to use, it's also kind of a cursed location because it's so easy um, to mess that up. Here you got your brake pedals. Um, so basically to put the parking brake on, you just engage them, and then you push the parking brake lever down here, and it locks the pedal down. So... This is the cruise control feature I was telling you about. Never use this, um, but I can see where if you're mowing big fields and you want a constant speed, that'd be okay. That'd be helpful, but nothing I'll ever use. Over here, you got your standard turn signals, obviously left, right, and then you have uh, the light switch here, and then you got your hazards. And then over here on the right-hand side, this is the PTO switch. So this allows you, um, once you have your safety brake set and you got your PO on, PTO on, you can press this and hold it. I think you need to hold it like five seconds and then the light stays on. And that'll enable you to get off the tractor without the PTO disengaging. So that's a, that's a convenient feature to have. And then of course here we just got the throttle, you know, slow up, fast down, um, but let me, uh, let me turn the ignition on here so you can get a look at the screen on this. Okay, I'm going to try to fit you in here between the steering wheel um, and give you a look at the display. So when you turn it on, um, let's see, you got your, you can see your turn signal indicator here for the left. And then you got your one over here for the right. So if we put the hazards on, they're both going. You got your battery light. Um, there's a parking brake indicator light. Let me see if that comes on. It does. Okay, that works good. And then below this must be like an engine light. Um, luckily, I haven't seen that before. But let's see if that flashes on when you just turn it on. Yep, so that comes on right away to check it. So on the right side over here, uh, the top light is a oil pressure light, then you have a coolant light, and then you have a glow plug light. So when you start to engage the glow plugs, I'm turning the key, you can see that come on. So as far as the display, you have your hours here on the right, 110.1 hours. Uh, you can scroll, there's a little knob over here. And with that knob, it'll show you your PTO speed at the rear, or it shows you the mid-mount PTO speed. So you can toggle between those. And then obviously your fuel gauge on the left-hand side. And then just to the right of the fuel gauge, you have a coolant temperature. So that'll have a gauge indicator on it when the tractor is running. And then in addition, that uh, toggle switch I was just showing you that showed the mid-mount and the rear-mount PTO, when you toggle between that and the tractor's running, it's going to go between uh, showing you the engine RPMs or showing you the PTO RPMs. So down here at the key, you basically got the stop position, you have your accessory position, and then the next one is when you hold it over, I showed you on the dash, but that's your glow plug position. So usually, you know, depending on the temperature, five to 10 seconds probably, and then you crank it all the way over to start it. Little thing I did is I saw this somewhere, some guy had this idea. Um, I thought it was genius. If you ever got stuck or rolled over and for some reason your seatbelt stuck and you can't get it unjammed, I just put a little jackknife on here so it's always here if you needed it to cut yourself out of the seatbelt or some kind of emergency just to have the jackknife handy. Okay, some of the final things here up in the cockpit is this here is your diff lock. Okay, so you push that all the way down to engage it. I will say it is very difficult to engage. There's been a few times where I've wanted to use it. Um, uh, Basically, it prevents wheel slippage and kind of helps you get out of a sticky situation sometimes if you're 
one of your wheels is sticking. I originally used it to get up my steep hill until I knew, you know, kind of the capabilities of the tractor. I would always make sure I had the diff lock engaged to go up so all, uh, all wheels were turning at the same time. Um, and then the other thing here is this is, uh, this here is a selector for the three point. So you open or close this and that's going to dictate how slow or how fast your three point is going to drop. So you could actually completely lock out the three point so it can't move on you. So if you ever have an issue where you find, hey, my three point's not working, check this gauge. That's likely the, the culprit. All right, guys, let's go ahead and start this up for you. So right here, you can see the engine RPMs. And like I said, with that toggle switch, I show here, I moved it to the rear PTO and obviously it's not engaged, so it's not showing anything. And then back to engine RPMs. So here's idle, this is all the way towards our turtle, 1040 RPM. So I guess you can see what full RPM was around 26, 2700. And then when we need to run my PTO implement for the, for the uh, wood chipper, I need to run at 540 so that I can switch here. Once I turn the PTO on, then it'll show me my speed that I can just, you know, hit the throttle until I get to about 540 and then I can engage it. So I'll show you what it's like engaging the PTO, give you an idea of the PTO speed. So right now you can see it's at the rear. So I'm going to go ahead and I got enough going right now that I should be able to, there's no load on it, so I should be able to start it here without killing the tractor or anything. Right now you can see I'm at 279 RPM. So if I was running my chipper, I'd have to be at 540. So you basically just keep on the throttle so you get it where you need it to be. And then back over here to just disengage the PTO. And we'll shut it off. Okay guys, so I have a tip for you. Guy at the dealership told me this. So if you find yourself wanting to switch from low to medium to high, and you're kind of stuck in between, don't try to jam it into place. Obviously right now it's no issue because I'm I'm just parked here. So um, don't try to jam it into place. What he, what he said is just basically give yourself just a little bit of 
forward or backward throttle and you'll probably move it to a place where it then becomes easy to move. So I've always found that if you're struggling with it, just give yourself a little throttle forward or backward and get into that spot where it's just easy to move again. Another tip, I can't state it enough. If you're going down a hill, um, make sure you're always in four wheel drive, okay? You're always gonna wanna go up and down the hill, not on the side, obviously. And then you're gonna wanna make sure that you're in low gear. Um, I've had this thing where when I get on my hill, I'm always in low four wheel drive, but there's been one or two times where I've been, I, I mentioned earlier, I like to have it in two wheel drive on my lawn, but there's been one or two times where I forgot to engage four wheel drive or low starting to get on the hill and the wheel started to slip on me. And that's a scary pucker feeling. So let me tell you, just try to keep in mind, I preach it all the time. Just make sure you're in low four wheel drive heading down any hill. So on this seat, it is nice. It, they do have the, the armrests that go up and down. So if those are in your way, you can move them. The biggest, one of the biggest complaints I have, I know some of my other YouTube buddies have complained about this as well, is this stupid uh, PTO shifter here is just a magnet to catch your pants. Uh, it's quite dangerous. You really, you gotta make sure that you're not wearing anything too baggy. And, and even when you're not, it's just, it's easy to catch your shirt on this. Or anything so um, this thing I don't know if they could have made it stubbier or chose a little different location I don't know maybe had two of them back here side by side I'm not sure but this thing is an issue a uh, few other minor gripes all I have on this tractor are basically minor gripes I've been very happy with this tractor so far it's performed well it's ran well um, no real issues with it just minor things so we just talked about this. The other thing is, I don't know. I, I know on a lot of the L series tractors, I'd be perfectly happy with the way those things are set up. They don't have these rubber floor mats to my knowledge. These things are wanting to come out of the grooves. This thing here, this cover is so easy to hit it with your foot and it pops out of place. This goofy little plastic or rubber piece here, um, half the time when I've been shifting uh this thing knocks this boot out of the place here uh then we got these plastic pieces back here all these little rubbery grommety you know i don't even know what you call them just these little things they they don't stay in place so they're kind of goofy and half the time i have the mind to just cut them things off because especially here this thing becomes this thing can become a trip hazard easy. Um, same thing with this thing getting moved around. So minor complaint number one. Uh, another complaint I have is the paint on this thing seems kind of weak. Uh, it kind of made me sick that I did this to the hood. Minor issue, uh, I found later when I'm using the bucket for a lot of dirt work that once in a while I'm getting a little bit of dirt spit here on the front of my hood. But I actually did this by just having my gas can sitting on top of the hood because it's such an awkward place to fill. Uh, I set my gas can up here. I'm, I actually just use a pump to pump my gas. That works pretty nice. But I set my gas can up here and there must have been a little rock or dirt or something on the bottom. It scratched the heck out of the hood right there. So uh, I know it's a small first world problem, but it seems like the paint would have been just a little bit more durable than that. And you can see kind of where I'm constantly coming on and off there. Uh, the paint doesn't last too long there. My other main gripe would be that I mentioned is this diff lock is extremely hard to engage. It's just, I don't know. It, it'd be awesome if it was a switch or something, um, but that that is very difficult to try to get the right indent to get it to engage. So you guys got any tips on that? I'd love to hear it. Uh, kind of like the shifting tip I gave. I don't know if there's other tips on that. I've, I've tried to find just the right position but it's still hard to get it engaged. So luckily I don't have to use it much anymore, but it is kind of a pain. And then I did notice over here, there was one thing that I forgot to show you guys when we were going around the cab. This over here is a lockout for the loader. So if you had the loader in a certain position and you didn't want it to move, uh, that's a lock for that. So sometimes it's easy to bump the loader handle. So by locking that, that prevents that from happening. Thing that also took me a while to notice never dawned on me but 
This seat easily flips back if you need to get out of your way for something. Okay guys, this is something the dealer did for me. You know, a lot of guys, I, I've never experienced this because mine left the dealership just like this. I know there's things you can buy uh, for here uh, that cost you a little bit of money to keep the ROPS in, locked up and engaged. And by putting this, uh, this bolt in here, you keep it from rattling. So it's as simple as that. The guy at the dealer just put an extra nut and a bolt in there and just kind of closed it off. So I wouldn't go spending any money on any goofy uh, ROPS contraptions there. Just find yourself a, a bolt and put it in there. Let me, I'm gonna take that out for you guys uh, before the end of the video. And in the description, I will put the thread pitch and the length of this. I'll go ahead and, and put that in my little tool and figure out how long that is and uh, what you need there. So you can maybe pick yourself up some of those at the hardware store. So guys, I just took it out. I think the reason that this had a nut on it was because this is a 30 millimeter. It was just probably too big for the wrap, so he threw a nut on it, which was kind of smart. Um, so this actual, if you're looking to buy some of these, you're actually looking for an M10 that has a one and a quarter inch pitch, and it's 25 millimeters long is what you need. So I said like those, this one is, uh, is 30 millimeters long, but it works as well. So M10, 1.25 by 25 millimeter. Then you don't need the nut, but who knows? Maybe he put the nut on there. Maybe that helps it from backing out as much. I have no idea. So you choose 25 without a nut or 30 with a nut, um, but that's been awesome. There's no, no rattle. And I just took this out. So this particular one actually had a 17 millimeter head on it. Okay, let's talk about another issue that's been plaguing me. We talked a little bit about the fuel location. Um, what I have struggled with mightily on this thing, and I don't know what the deal is with it. And curious if you guys are watching this and you have a, a Kubota, if you've seen this. So with these plastic fuel caps, I struggle a lot of times to get it to thread on properly. It's just terrible. Sometimes I've put it on five or six times and I start to notice, nope, that's not threaded right. Try it again, nope, that's not threaded right. What I just did to hopefully help myself a little bit is I took a paint marker when I had it going on correctly and I, I made a paint mark here and then on the top just to try to get myself right the first time. So, and if I give it a little bit of a beat down there, then, okay, right now, see right now, it doesn't even seem like it's threading on correctly. So even when I try to line it up, like that's still helpful to, to get it in the vicinity, but it just doesn't always take. So I don't know if this is an issue with all these or if this one in particular, something got cross-threaded, but there now it's going on okay. But if it's not going on easy, it's cross-threaded and it seems to be a pain. So one of the things on my Facebook group, which I don't know if you guys are, some of you guys might be a part of, but they're always talking about the infamous screen that people put in here. And I was waiting until today to put it in because I didn't know if I put it in. I wanted to save it and show you guys on the video. I didn't know if I put it in, if it would come out easy. So people put a screen in here just, I guess, as an ounce of prevention to prevent any gas debris from getting in your tank some guys have had some debris get in there and it's been an expensive thing for them so there's a real inexpensive fix that you can put a screen in here some people put coffee strainers and just all kinds of weird stuff in here but i did find a post where somebody posted the part number and what they actually have is it's actually a john deere part and it's kind of funny that we're putting a, a john deere a filter in the Kubota, but I'm sure most all these things are kind of universal. This tank is probably universal to a lot of different tractors, and it just so happens that this John Deere filter is supposed to fit perfectly, so let's find out if that's the case. So this is the M117464. Uh, I will put a link to this in the description so you can find it, but uh, this is what I'm going to use for the solution, and let's see. Bam! drops right in like a perfect fit so and look at this I, I hadn't even put it in here until now but it comes out just as easy as it goes in so i guess that was a inexpensive solution to 
you know, prevent some fuel gunk. And I guess the nice part is it does come out really easy. So if you got something in there, you could pull it out and clean it. So there must just be obviously a little, little lip inside here. Yep, that that rests in. So hey, good thing we didn't lose it in the tank the first time, huh? Now let's see if I can get this cap on as easily as last time. So we'll try to line that up. Yeah, this was an easy one this time. So on a positive side, this diesel seems to go pretty easy on the fuel. So I believe that I believe it has a six and a half gallon tank, um, and I just I just keep five gallons around at all times. And I did f learn a new tip recently. Uh, my gas station that's near me, their diesel was about forty or fifty cents more a gallon expensive than just another five, six miles down the freeway. And people are saying that's because the ones on the freeway are more truck stop. They have a lot more truck traffic. I don't know, but it was crazy that the diesel could fluctuate that much within, you know, five, six miles. But um, so now I just keep my diesel can in the back of my truck. And when I go by that station, I make sure that I fill up while I'm there because, hey, if you can save, uh, you know, 250 filling up your five gallon can, you might as well get it while you're there. Okay, let's do a little walk around. So the one thing I have repaired already is this top link. I bent mine. Uh, I screwed it up myself. I had my ballast back here that didn't have the proper amount of relief on it. You'd be able to see that in one of my other videos where I built that ballast. But I got this one from Tractor Supply. Um, but I'm very happy with it. It, it seems way more heavy duty even than, than the one that came on it. So I've replaced this. And then back here you'll notice something a little bit different too. I installed this. Uh, I ran some 12 volt wire up to my battery and I got this uh, quick disconnect back here and then I put the same kind of setup on my winch. So I have a winch set up um, that I can put on my three point uh, trailer hitch back here in case I was wanting to skid a log or if I got in a situation where I needed to be able to pull my tractor and winch it a little bit, I basically got that. So I put it on my quick hitch. Um, let me just come over here and show you the winch setup while we're here. So this is what I did. I, I got this traveler winch from uh, Tractor Supply. It's got this bracket that has a hitch mount. And then I went ahead and, and cut the connections off. And then I just wired up this. Uh, that goes in the back of that tractor bracket. So knock on wood, I haven't had to really use it for anything uh, crazy. I've, I've moved a stump with it one time and that's worked well. Um, but I just wanted to have that as kind of a safety factor before I even really got using my tractor to have that ready to go. And then this is what I use it on. It's, it's probably not the greatest. Probably if you're going to use your winch a lot, you'd probably be better off to get this drawbar taken out maybe. I never used this drawbar, uh, but take that drawbar out and maybe have a uh, receiver welded onto that and then you're right to the frame instead of using your three-point linkage. But the way I have it set up is I just put that, I take out my uh, hitch obviously and just put that one right in the receiver there. So this, uh, this Spico quick hitch, I'll do a different review on that. That thing is awesome. I had the pats for a while, didn't really care for them too much because I liked having the three points of contact versus the two on the pats. Um, this trailer mover, that's a separate piece. I got that from Everything Attachments. But this Spico part comes on and off in under a minute, and it's just really convenient. There's, there's very few things that I don't use it with. The only reason I'm not using it right now for this is because I had my ballast on. And the ballast is the only thing that I can't use the quick hitch on. So I had taken the ballast off and I wanted to hook up the uh, the rake. So I just hooked it up while I was down in the woods uh, because I had already had this up here in the garage. So uh, this also works well with the, uh, the quick hitch. So getting back to the tractor, uh, here's the rear PTO. Um, this little guard here flips up. I didn't know that at first. So... It was kind of in my way for a while, but yeah, that flips up nicely and out of the way. 
This is the dipstick for the transmission fluid as well as the hydraulic fluid. And then here's the fill point for that in the back. Uh, what else back here? Uh, not much. I did, somehow I jacked this thing up. I just took it out and straightened it in a vise. Uh, but these are nice. I've used these several times, especially when I had the pats. Uh, I don't use them too much now, but these are nice. These just come out with a cotter pin and these are adjustable. So that helps sometimes when it's difficult hooking up something uh, like my, uh, my ballast for sure. Sometimes I have to pull those pins and, and get a little bit of extra clearance on one side or the other to get that thing hooked up. Uh, back to a complaint, uh, this rear toolbox is terrible. Um, I actually had another video where I came up with a toolbox solution, but it was hanging out here a little bit too far in the back and it was, I was still having issues with my top link because of that. So I ended up taking it off and I'm back to this temporarily. Um, so curious if you guys got any links for any better toolbox solutions, but uh, you can barely put anything in this thing. Uh, which is why it was very disappointing. So I actually just have uh, the toolkit that I had mounted on here before. I still got all my tools in it. If I'm going to be out there working in the woods for several hours, I just got it to the to where I'll mount it to the front of my brush guard. I'll just uh, take some bungees and basically I just stick it in this spot right here and mount it and it, then I got it with me. So that, that doesn't work too bad. So this is that Land Pride third function kit that I was showing you when we were at the loader valve. So here's the, uh, the hookups for that and that just runs around. It's a pretty clean install. It goes around there and, and back to the, uh, to the joystick. So that's not something I wanted to, to mess with. Uh, so I had them do that. Okay, probably my absolute favorite feature of this tractor is the skid steer quick connect this thing has worked awesome it's really cool being able to quickly take these off put my pallet forks on or if i want to put my stump bucket on they're all quick changes i can do them all in under a minute no tools um, so how that works is you basically have this lever here and this lever here and then there's a pin that goes underneath the bucket so one thing i do is these are basically up and then you drive under there you hook up under here and then you put put the lever down you just want to make sure that the bucket or whatever is fully back onto the quick connect otherwise when you push that down those pins might not necessarily engage so these pins got it you got to make sure that they're when you're looking from the underneath side you'll see that pin going through in fact let me lift up the loader and show you what that looks like so this is what that pin looks like on the underside. So I always, whenever I'm hooking up anything up here, I always do a visual check to make sure I'm seeing both of those underneath there because I've had it before where if this bucket isn't laying back right, that pin's not gonna engage through there. So you see guys on the internet where they've hooked something up, they've thought it's been hooked up and then they've lost it. So just always check for that. I guess another good tip for you guys uh, to make sure your loader's properly attached. So it's really cool that you can use a universal setup like that. I really appreciate that about the Kubota and a lot of the other manufacturers. And that's what John Deere did not do. They went with their proprietary system, which fine, great for them. But like my neighbor, if he wants to use my pallet forks, he's out of luck. He can't use them. Um, my other neighbor, so two of my neighbors have John Deere's. One of them was wanting to use my pallet forks. He can't use them because of the John Deere. One of my other neighbors has a grapple. And he was like, hey, if you ever want to use my grapple, I'd love to let you borrow it. I can't use his grapple. It's got a John Deere type quick connect on it. So uh, again, be glad if you're looking at this tractor. This is, this is a selling point. Let me show you how this hood opens. So you have this front brush guard here and there's a little j-pin down here you pull that and then you can lift it forward and then the the trick to open in the hood is this uh this lever right here so you just turn that and then you can lift up it's heavy and kind of awkward but i stand on the left side of the tractor and then basically here's the pin and then that has this little area it goes in here so um 
give you a look at the engine. So battery location in the front, radiator, here's the air cleaner. I just took that air filter out yesterday and gave it a good blowing out. Um, here is the oil fill right here on this side. And they do have these little plastic guards that come out of the side to make it a little more accessible to get into. And then back here, uh, just behind this uh, air line here, here's the, the oil dipstick. So it's kind of hard to find the first time. Everything's painted gray and kind of hard to see, but that's where that is. And then since we're looking at fill points, there's one down here on the front axle. Um, this is also a dipstick. So go ahead and pull that out and check it. Make sure your level's good on here. You're not supposed to do anything on this till 400 hours, but good to check the level and make sure it's good. I just checked mine again yesterday and everything's looking good. And then I just noticed down here, um, and I think there may be two on this tractor, um, but here's an obvious one, but fuel filter. As far as other greasable points, I do not believe there are any. If there are, I've missed them. Um, I would appreciate it if you guys would point it out to me. I thought I remember going over this with the dealer and I don't think we were able to find any um, anything that needed greased with the exception of the loader. The loader has lots of points on it. There's probably at least 10. Um, I'll probably do another video once I grease this just to show you guys all the loader greasing points. But um, other than that, it's, you know, it's pretty low maintenance, I think. You know, my first service was at 50 hours. Um, I'll put a link to that at the end of the video. I got a playlist with a, a lot of different other Kubota videos I've done, but my first one was my 50 hour service. So kind of walk you guys through the fluids and ounces and, and everything you need to do that service. But um, overall, my next service won't be due until I hit 200 hours. So 90 hours to go before that one. So let's close this hood. We'll just reverse the process. So I'll use my left hand over here. Pull it up, put this back in the holder, and then I bring it down at about here, and then just make sure you're straight, and then I just drop it. And then pull the J-pin, put this back. So guys, I think that's going to about wrap it up. I hope this was a good overview for you guys. I wanted to show you kind of some, some gripes, some complaints, some things I love about it. It's been a great tractor so far. I hope it gives me lots of years of, of great service. Um, I'd buy the same model again. Um, so I've been happy with it. And one of the things we didn't talk about, I went with the 26 horsepower model. That's been pretty sufficient for everything I need. The reason I went with this versus the 33 or larger is because staying at this size keeps you out of all the emissions add-ons that have to go on the engine. You don't have to have any regeneration or any of that to deal with. Um, so that's kind of what's nice about this series and pretty much it has the power to do everything that I'm asking of it. The only thing I'd change, uh, I guess if I could, is have a little bit more loader capacity. Sometimes um, this bucket seems awful small to me sometimes when I'm trying to move a lot of material. It takes a lot of trips. Um, guy could actually get a lighter material bucket if you wanted to lift more light materials, but this pretty much is at capacity when I fill it up with rocks or dirt. So uh, a little more lift capacity would be nice, but you know, for what I'm using it for, this has been a great tractor. So guys, I appreciate you tuning in. I hope this was helpful to you. Please go ahead and hit that like button. Feel free to share this video. Helps out the channel a lot. And um, if you want, consider subscribing. I'd love to have you stick around for more content. I'll go ahead and place a bunch of uh, my other Kubota playlist videos at the end, and then I'll do a special link uh, just for that 50-hour uh, service video. So hope you enjoyed this, and we'll see you on the next one. Hey, guys. Tennessee Yankee. Thanks for watching. If you found this content helpful, go ahead and hit that subscribe button on your right. I have other content linked for you on the left side. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. Thanks again for watching.